Good morning. I am Jennifer Puck. I'm one of the leaders of the uh, Insight Project at the University of California in San Francisco. And our project is called uh, Newborn Sequencing, or NBSeq. And I'm joined uh, by uh, Dr. Puyan Kwok and Barbara Koenig, who will talk to you uh, just after I do uh, in the leadership of this project. So our site, uh, which won one of the uh, competitions for funding, uh, aims to explore potential applications of whole exome sequencing, which I'm going to abbreviate WES in this presentation. And uh, we're looking at how this could be applied to public health newborn screening. We want to develop whole exome sequencing from archived blood spots, or DBS, as you'll see on the next slides. Um, and California is unique in that it has saved residual dried blood spots used for newborn testing and under very uh, rigorous controlled circumstances can make these available for research. So we are using them to look at uh, currently screened metabolic disorders and primary immune deficiencies. We want to build on our experience with California screening for severe combined immunodeficiency or SCID, also popularly known as uh, the bubble boy disease. And uh, this screening program has identified infants with low T lymphocytes, some of whom have uh, SCID and many who have had a gene diagnosis now made by whole exome sequencing. We also will study parents' views and values regarding newborn screening, and uh, that part of the project is run by Barbara Koenig. So here are some of our methodologic questions. We want to know what are the sensitivity and specificity of whole exome sequencing for metabolic disorders? And our first naive question here was, can whole exome sequencing replace the tandem mass spectroscopy that is now used? And I think uh, we have come to the conclusion already that uh, the exome sequencing that we are able to do today is actually not going to replace this. Um, but then again, uh, maybe the sequence analysis can augment the information that we derive from uh, metabolic screening. In other words, we'd like to know, could it identify uh, patients who might have an abnormal screen and yet be asymptomatic during their lifetime, or uh, in contrast, patients who would need early intervention and special diets, for example. We also want to know, would addition of deep sequencing shorten the time to a definitive diagnosis and relieve parents of the anxiety of waiting to see what their child really has? For infants and children with immune system defects, Early diagnosis is essential for optimum treatment and outcome. And so here, we want to ask a different, uh, in a different set of patients, can whole exome sequencing detect pre-symptomatic immune disorders that would otherwise not be found before onset of serious infectious complications? So uh, these are the methods and samples that we are using. We have an IRB-approved collaboration with the California Department of Public Health Genetic Disease Laboratory. And through this collaboration, we are obtaining archived dried blood spots from which all identifying information has been removed, but the phenotype or clinical data regarding the metabolic diagnosis is still available. We are also uh, getting archived dried blood spots from identified subjects with known or suspected immune system disorders, and these are obtained following written informed consent. 
our pilot DNA extraction and whole exome sequencing and analysis have been optimized with very old uh, anonymous samples and also samples from our immune deficient patient cohort. We've worked on sequence annotation and variation calling for metabolic disorders, um, and we're looking really at a restricted part of the genome here uh, to a particular list of metabolic disease genes uh, and gene pathways. And we are using informatics that has been custom designed uh, in collaboration with our, our uh, partners at Berkeley and uh, Tata Consultancy Services, led by Stephen Brenner. We also have an immunodeficiency variant calling system uh, using the whole exome. So how do we isolate our DNA? This is a picture of a, a large DNA robot called Autogen 965, which we use, and uh, it uses a 96-well deep plate uh, in which a tiny punch, three millimeters in diameter, from the newborn blood spot is placed. And the method involves uh, digestion of proteins in this dried blood spot sample and then precipitation of the DNA. And we actually find that we can isolate plenty of DNA this way to do a whole exome sequence, that is to, isol to sequence all the genes um, in the, this uh, sample of human DNA. We always look at the quality of our DNA, and this is a photograph of an electrophoresis. And you can see that in the top line, um, there's one sample that um, maybe I can point to, well, no, I can't, um, that has perhaps a little bit of degradation. Um, but all the other samples from these newborn dried blood spots show very nice uh, yields of intact DNA. So although we don't, uh, for example, California does not save DNA from dried blood spots, we do have the capability when we have permission to use these spots of uh, making adequate DNA. And one way to assess whether our DNA is adequate is to go ahead and do the uh, whole exome sequencing. And here we're comparing a dried blood spot DNA sample to a sample obtained from fresh blood. And what is depicted in these two graphs is the um, exome coverage, or number of individual reads that uh, cover these regions of uh, one particular gene that is on our metabolic panel. And you can see that the dried blood spot and the fresh blood give essentially comparable results. The immune deficiency part of our project relates to newborn screening, which has already been instituted for the most severe immune deficiency. And we test for that in every baby in California using a biomarker uh, called T-cell receptor excision circles, or TREX. And as you can see in the cartoon, uh, which is a diagram of the T cell receptor. Um, this gene gets rearranged in developing T cells, and the leftover pieces, which here are shown in brown, are deleted from what will eventually be the mature gene and turned into circles. And then a PCR reaction across the joint of that circle can reveal uh, whether T cells are being made appropriately, or the absence of these circles suggests that a baby might have a serious immune disorder. So that is the basis of um, the universal U newborn screening for SCID. And in cases that are identified by screening this way, some of them have a quite readily detectable uh, uh, definitive diagnosis, but others do not. And so of uh, 34 of the cases without a good diagnosis that we have looked at, uh, we've been able to diagnose 13 
after um, doing whole exome sequencing. And again, this is with uh, the patient's consent. So this is a 38% rate of getting a definitive diagnosis, and we have three more under study uh, because each good candidate has to be confirmed in an immunology lab to see whether that really is the cause of disease. And um, if all three of these uh, cases pan out, then the rate of success would be 47 percent, which is actually a very high success rate compared to other projects using whole exome sequencing that run about 25 to 33 percent success. So we do believe that this is a very good way to approach patients identified with a possible immune deficiency, uh, but without a definitive diagnosis. And just to show you which states are doing newborn screening for SCID, this is something that started uh, in 2008 in Wisconsin, um, and uh, uh, Louisiana had a pilot, then Massachusetts and California was one of the earliest adopters in 2010. But this has been spreading very, uh, very uh, rapidly to other states, so that now over three quarters of the babies in the country are being screened with this TREK biomarker, and we anticipate um, that almost all babies will be screened by the end of 2016. What we're finding in general from this is quite different from what you would find if you open any old textbook about SCID or read any of the literature coming from SCID bone marrow transplant centers, um, as shown on the uh, left side of this um, slide. And you can see, um, compared to that, on the right side are patients in California with SCID identified by newborn screening. And the sections of this pie chart are quite different, showing that the proportions, when you look at an unbiased newborn screen sample, are, are not the same as the cases that in the past got all the way to a referral center for treatment. And that's not because um, we have fewer for example, X-linked SCID cases with the IL-2RG gene, it's because we're finding more cases with autosomal recessive disorders, and we believe that in the past, these babies died of infections before their condition was recognized. And another important thing to note on this slide is the little section of, uh, that's colored tan that shows the unknown cases. So before newborn screening, we thought we had solved the uh, underlying diagnosis in almost all cases. But now that we have newborn screening, um, we're showing in California 12% of our cases don't have one of the SCID genes we already knew about, and that means we have a lot more work to do. So these are the uh, infants who are going to be enrolling with consent uh, with identifiers into our uh, immune deficiency program. And here's an example of um, one of the unknown cases that turned out not to have skid, but very low T cells. We enrolled this family and did the uh, whole exome sequence. And you can see um, as we filtered away the variants that um, had low quality or were not part of the immune system or did not change uh, a protein, we were left with actually very few. And in this case, we documented that the infant had ataxia telangiectasia. This is actually not a treatable condition at this time, although there are research protocols considering ways to treat it. But the family was able to take advantage of this uh, information because um, this is also a breast cancer um, uh, susceptibility gene, so we were able to inform the parents, and we were also able to give them anticipatory guidance for caring for the child and uh, reproductive counseling. Meanwhile, there are many uh, immune disorders that are not detectable 
by trek screening, and I've listed some on this slide, um, anything that involves T cells beyond the stage at which the T cell receptor rearranges uh, would, would have a normal TREC biomarker, even if the T cells don't function properly. And those are the conditions listed on the top here. There are also many syndromes that have variable amounts of T cell deficiency, and uh, these can be very severe. Uh, and then there are also immune defects that don't involve T cells, but involve other uh, aspects of the immune system, such as antibody production, which is missing in X-linked A-gamma globulinemia or chronic granulomatous disease. And it would be very useful and very important to be able to detect these conditions early so that we could get the children on prophylactic antibiotics before they experience life-threatening infections. We just don't have good markers for that now, like the TREC marker, and therefore uh, deep sequencing is probably going to be necessary uh, to look at these. And so a part of this uh, project, as shown in bold here, is um, could newborn screening whole exome sequencing identify actionable primary immunodeficiency conditions prior to the onset of infectious complications. And uh, in order to do this uh, study, we are enrolling patients from our immune deficiency clinic after the time their uh, diagnosis has been obtained. And of course, we have to take patients who are born in California so that their uh, archived dried blood spots will be accessible. And then with informed consent, we fish out the uh, leftover dried blood spots and do whole exome sequencing. So far, we've enrolled 10 individuals and plan to enroll 50. And um, as I showed earlier, we expect a rate of finding a gene from the newborn dried blood spot of uh, up, to, um, up to above 30 to even 40%. So I'm going to now turn the um, uh, screen over to Barbara Koenig, who's going to talk about the ethical uh, program in our UCSF uh, NewBeSeq.